welcome to our uh, National Public Health Week events on the scope of practice of the speech language pathologists and audiologists during the COVID-19 pandemic. This event is supported by our National Student Speech Language Hearing Association in our Department of Speech Language Hearing Sciences. Um, we want to thank all of you for coming onto an additional Zoom today to meet our clinical colleagues and hear their stories in the healthcare, healthcare fields during COVID-19. A year after the onset of the pandemic and crisis, uh, fear of the coronavirus epidemic is rippling through our country. And it's that fear is going faster than even the disease spreading, it seems. Our whole sense of normalcy has shifted a year ago for students, faculty, and staff at Hofstra University and across the world. However, our questions are, what about the impact on our healthcare systems? Were we prepared to deal with this crisis? As a Department of Audiologists and Speech Language Pathologists, how have our fellow colleagues dealt with COVID-19 in their work settings, both personally and professionally? So these are questions that we will explore with our panelists in just a few. And as a side note, we started a graduate chapter of our, nat, our, of our NISHLA, and we are focusing our attention on the effects of COVID-19 on hearing, speech, cognition, language, and swallowing in this afternoon's event. Oh, and I should introduce myself. I'm Dr. Susan Dimitropoulos. <laughs> so, and Wendy Silverman, our clinic director, is next. Hi everybody, I'm Wendy Silverman, Director of the Speech Language Hearing Clinic at Hofstra. And um, welcome and thank you for taking time to join us today. I'm sure it's gonna be a very, very interesting conversation. Um, I'd like to thank and acknowledge our three graduate students, Caitlin Vespa, our graduate liaison, uh, Victoria Hartnett and Ashley Villatoro. Um, in addition, I'd like to thank our um, Nishla eBoard member and senior in the program, Alyssa Seminario. Um, we're very appreciative of their hard work on behalf of the speech language hearing department. I'd also like to thank uh, our department chair, Dr. Jenny Roberts, and our dean from the School of Health, Dr. Holly Syrup. And um, the, I'd like to thank Dr. Corinne Kiriaku, who is the um, spearhead be behind the whole week of public health events. Um, and I'd, I'd, I'd like to thank um, Tony Porcelli um, for coordinating the whole week. He works very, very hard. Um, and then I'd like to, without further ado, introduce our speakers for today who uh, graciously volunteered to share their experience. Oh, one more um, person, Wendy, sorry. Joyce Hidalgo, our administrative, oh. our administrative assistant who helped uh, promote the uh, work, so thank you. Always, we cannot function without Joyce Hidalgo. Um, our audiology guest is Dr. Lisa Maynard from Northwell Health um, and also an alumni of Hofstra. Our three speech language pathologists are Stephen Nasovsky, alumni of Hofstra, and director of the South Shore Speech Language and Swallowing Disorders Practice. Um, Melissa Jensen, senior speech language pathologist at Northwell Transitions of Long Island. And Aggie Zimney, um, also at Transitions of Long Island as a speech language pathologist. So welcome. Just some housekeeping tips. Um, put all your questions in the chat box and we will address them at the end of our session. We'll leave time for that. And I'd like to move it to our students who are going to facilitate this interesting conversation. So, Hello. Oops, oh, this is first, okay. So oh, sorry. Um, so, First topic is just going to be about introductions. So Dr. Meener, Stephen Asofsky, Melissa Jensen, and Aggie Zimney, please like briefly tell us about yourself and why did you get into the medical healthcare scope of our field? So starting with uh, Lisa, Dr. Meener. Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for having me. It's nice to see some familiar faces. Like Wendy said, I'm an alumni of the Hofstra Consortium. Um, so 
about myself, I didn't really picture myself being in healthcare for audiology. Actually, it just, I kind of up, ended up here, but it's a great, I'm glad where I ended up. It's a great uh, hospital to work at. I had my fourth year externship here. And so I was able to stay on and got hired after that fourth year externship. And so it was, um, it's been a really, it's a really busy center. We see a lot of interesting cases. Uh, I get to go into the OR. I do ABRs, cochlear implants, basically the whole realm of audiology. So I feel like if I were to go elsewhere, I'd be saying like, what's next? I'm so excited about it. There's a lot of different things to be involved in, a lot of different people to meet. You work with the surgeons. So it really just from having experience in private practice and going through the outside placements and my externship, this kind of was uh, where I found to be the most interesting and where I wanted to be. And that's how I ended up here. Great, thank you. So Steve, how about you? Hi everyone, and thank you also um, for having us. Um, great, great topic uh, to be part of this discussion. So I'm um, a recent graduate of Hofstra back in uh, 1994, um, where I received my master's and also uh, prior to that, my, my bachelor's. Um, so I got into more of the medical aspect of the field um, because I realized there was a huge component of this medical um, field of speech pathology as opposed to there is that um, great contingency for the educational, but I see myself more as um, you know, the medical, the finite, um, you know, if you do, then you get um, type of aspect in, in this field. I've been able to um, set up the practice um, through birth, through geriatrics. So I have the entire spectrum of life, which is amazing to be in a NICU and to work with um, a preemie baby and to help them uh, with the suck, swallow and breathing all the way through. My oldest patient was 108 also. Um, was able to see her in, in radiology for some minor changes in, in diet. Um, I work with voice disorders, feeding disorders, uh, motor speech disorders, congenital syndromes, and acquired neurogenic is my main practice um, and specialties within. Um, I've been able to perform modified barium swallow studies, so I've set them up in hospitals and in radiology. Um, I have also then um, was able to get certified in flexible endoscopy evaluation of FEAST procedures through Columbia with Dr. Aviv, who actually invented the sensory component to FEAST. So I've had um, wonderful opportunities in that aspect. I went on to get certified in neuromuscular electrical stimulation and also LSVT to treat Parkinson's and other neurogenic disorders. Uh, being in uh, the medical aspect as well, you get to work in a team, um, which is crucial with um, treating patients. So I too get to work with other allied health professionals, physical therapists, occupational therapists, special educators, psychologists, social workers, and also a lot of um, medical practitioners, ENTs and, and neurologists and regular PCPs. So being part of that team and getting that support is, is just um, an awesome experience when you're working and helping to get an individual to where they need to go. Um, also part of um, a um, health center where I am the rehab su supervisor, and I got to um, play a very special part there and um, advocate for the special population of OPWDD. So um, that's also a, a very wonderful um, aspect and another um, component um, to uh, being an SLP. So that's, that's really um, where I see myself um, in this profession and helping and providing. Um, and lastly, I also get to teach. Um, I'm part of uh, the faculty as an adjunct instructor. So I get to pass on that knowledge and experience um, to the students at, at Hofstra teaching their um, swallowing disorders and motor speech disorders classes. So I guess that's enough about me. I think I hear that music uh, kicking me off. Uh, so <laughs> we'll get off with it. Thank you, Steve. How about you, Melissa? I am Melissa Jensen. I am a speech language pathologist at Transitions of Long Island. Aggie is my coworker. Um, Transitions of Long Island is an outpatient facility, so we do neuro rehab for adults. 
Um, so we see mostly adults, but we will see some children, depending upon the age, from 12, 13, um, because we're one of the only facilities that have the comprehensive program um, for neuro specific neuro rehab facility that has OT, PT, speech, and counseling services on site, all housed in one facility. Um, how I got into the field, um, I graduated Hofstra with a marketing business degree. I worked for about a year and I made some nice money and it was just not fulfilling. So I had to do some soul searching, figure out what I was going to do. I was gonna do nursing, I was gonna do psychology. I knew I wanted to like connect with people. And then my mom started her graduate program. She started later in life and she was going for speech language pathology. And I'm like, oh, this looks pretty good. I can go into it. And then that's how um, I, I fell into the field and, and fell in love with it. I did my um, CFY here at Transitions. I did my um, one of my externships at the VA in Brooklyn. And um, I just fell in love with the adult neuro population and I've just never fell out of love with it. Um, I did have um, some home care opportunities where I got to work with some kids. Then I took them through um, I guess I started working with them in grade school until they went through high school home care and privately. Um, and that was also exciting. So I still had my neuro adults as my full-time job and that was my day to day, but I still got to have a little bit um, of the kids to work with. Um, I think that's about it. Aggie, you wanna introduce yourself? Yeah, so my name is Aggie Zimney. I am also at Transitions of Long Island, so I'm actually relatively new. I've been here for almost three years. So I started out working with kids as part of my CFY, and then I got the opportunity to finish the second half of my CFY here and was lucky enough to stay on onto a full-time speech therapist. Um, I'm certified in NMES and LSBT as well. And very much similar to what Melissa said, we work with a great population of adults. And ever since I did my graduate externship here, I wanted nothing but to be here. And I'm lucky enough to be here. Great, thank it. you all so much. Okay, so now we're gonna dig a little deeper and Caitlin's gonna present our next topic. So can you guys describe how your day-to-day -day practice management has changed since March of 2020? Um, if Stephen, if you can start off our conversation about this, and then we'll go to Melissa, Aggie, and then Lisa. Sure. Um, so this has been quite a year for, for everyone. Um, so um, COVID hit, um, and March 13th, we actually closed our doors to our practice here. Um, it was a frightening experience and uncertainty. Um, we didn't know it was, it was a... Um, an invisible enemy, so to speak. So we don't know who had it, where it was, um, how do you protect yourself? So things were changing and, and evolving um, on a hour to hour, day to day basis. Um, so things definitely have changed. Um, as far as um, the, the profession itself for day to day, um, when March hit and most private institutions, I know the hospitals and some of the, the, um, the other institutions, we were still going on forward, just trying to figure out what to do, what masks to use, what gowns to use, what face shields to use, um, you know, double glove, boots, hats, you know, it was just, you know, it felt like the wild, wild west. What do we do next? Teletherapy was not yet an, a necessity. Speech was not a necessity yet. Um, so we didn't even know if we were going to be doing teletherapy. So I was actually on a committee um, to, to write to Albany stating that speech therapy is a necessity because we have many um, adults and children out there who rely on our services. So how are we going to get our service to them? And who is going to benefit from the services? So management definitely had to change um, because we couldn't have people come right through the door right away. We didn't know how to get them in the door. And people were afraid. People were staying in their homes. Um, no one knew how this um, was transmitted and, and how it would hit people. Um, so we finally were able to get the teletherapy. Um, so my doors closed March 13th, that Friday. I didn't open again truly until September. 
uh, of 2020. I was here in um, June and July trying to get my office set up. So you talk about management changing. We had to get all PPEs, the gloves, the masks, the shields, um, air purifiers. Um, I have air purifiers in every single room now, the reception area, receptionist area, um, different grade air purifiers, depending on what we were going to be doing because you have speech therapy, which is very different than swallowing therapy, which becomes more aerosol based. That being said, we had to manage how we were going to keep our supplies and what items we're going to use, whether it was a regular mask, a KN or an N95 duckbill mask. So those had to also change. Um, the cleaning agents, I often wondered how, you know, and, and how dirty were we? Um, because now it was, you, you sat in that chair, clean it. Um, you touch that pen, clean it. You have um, dirty pens, clean pens, um, you know, stethoscopes that touch people. We now have little pads that, so it doesn't touch their skin. You know, it's, it's crazy how we, we manage our, our, our time now and, and what goes into now our therapies um, and our daily practices. Attestations for patients, which we never had to do on a daily basis. They have to come in. Were they uh, exposed to COVID? Do they have a temperature, taking temperatures? So all of those aspects um, are also part of this management um, change. So, and uh, I joked around about wearing um, a suit today um, to this, but I've been wearing scrubs for the first time an entire year in 25 years of practice. I always wore a suit and tie. I realized I couldn't get them clean because my cleaners was closed. So it's, it's these little finite details of what do you do? So now we've got scrubs. I used to um, change in my garage to then throw everything in and to get them sanitized because I didn't want to infect anybody. We didn't know how it, it transmitted. My patients coming into back to the office would say, is your office safe? They're afraid. So I said, well, I'm here and you know, I, I think it's pretty safe. I wouldn't work in an environment. I have a family. I don't want to bring that home to them. I have, um, you know, grandparents, parents that I don't want to infect either. So that's why we took um, the precautions that we did. I would sit here like Ghostbusters. I even have the air fogger near me. And I would fog the office after every single night just to make sure after everybody's cleaned everything, we then had that extra um, care to it. So you know, we, we now have um, the hybrid fashion, which I think is the way to, that it's going to be for a while. Um, we still have these ups and downs and spikes. So we're managing therapies that way if they are willing to even participate. We have families that we can't see because they don't have the technology. There are disorders that we can't treat because you can't be physical. I, I wouldn't want to do um, a dysphagia or swallowing therapy with somebody who's potentially choking and they live by themselves. I don't want to see them choke in front of me. Um, for voice, you, we don't have the instrumentation that we can use. You can't necessarily see their breathing. Um, so certain aspects of therapies, those did not exist during COVID times until they were able to feel comfortable to come in. We've managed them by um, having some patients, you know, do wait in the car, wait in the waiting room, the six feet apart, come in from a separate entrance. So there were many different things that went into managing um, the, the patients coming in, starting up during these um, crazy COVID times. So I hope that um, covers a bunch of what happened, at least on the private um, aspect. As far as the health center, like I said, we were full operational um, from the get-go and we never skipped a beat with it. So great question. Okay, thank you, Steve. How about you, Melissa? So transitions falls under Northwell Health, Health System. Um, so we were fully operational as well. I don't know if it's possible to share a slide. Um, yeah, we have you as a co-host, so you can share. I can share, okay. Let's see if I could do this though. <laughs> okay, I would like to share this slide. Aggie and myself have um, been working on a presentation um, for North Health, North, Northwell. <laughs> We are uh, presenting at the Brain Injury Conference on the outpatient um, therapy. Do you see my PowerPoint or no? Now we do. You do? Okay, mm -hmm. great, okay. 
Um, let me see if I can hide this. And can you see most of this chart? Yeah, it's all yeah. there. You're good. Okay. Great. Um, so what we did was we're doing a presentation on COVID at the outpatient level, and we put together this chart um, and it takes us through a timeline. So we, we wanted to show what a typical day would look like at the outpatient level um, before COVID hit and then kind of what happened during the peak um, of the pandemic and then kind of how things evolved and how our numbers shifted a little bit over time. So January 21st of 2020, um, the CDC had its first case and we had scheduled visits of 101 um, for various reasons at the outpatient level. People have medical appointments, people are unwell, um, people have transportation difficulties. So we don't ever get 100% attendance of um, our scheduled visits in terms of who attends, um, but we wanted to show the range and what happens as we got a little bit um, in the stickier thick of the, the pandemic. So we had 101 visits scheduled, 78 people attended that day. So these are visits for OT, PT, and speech, as well as counseling. So this is for the whole site of transitions. That's what a typical day would look like. So we have another normal day, March hits, um, and we have 110 people scheduled, 89 people came. This was when the um, second case in New York State hit, and that was the New Rochelle case. The first case that we had in New York State, the person quarantined and it wasn't a big deal, but this was like our first first super spreader where we saw how sick somebody could get and how rapidly it just spread throughout the community. Um, still, we had great attendance. On the 11th, the WHO declared it a pandemic. Transitions had 118 patients scheduled and 100 people came that day for treatment. Um, then just fast forward just a little bit. And then the 20th of March, New York State announced its closures and its stay at home orders. And we had 90 people on the schedule and only 23 people came. So people were getting scared. People started not coming. They didn't want to cancel yet, um, but it was very, it was, it was starting. It was starting to get scary for everybody. On the 15th of April, we had the, the face mandate and we had 47 people on the schedule and only 32 people came. Then you fast forward to the governor extending the stay at home orders and the New York state closures and people really got scared and there were only 18 treatment sessions across the board. So that could have been just like 10 patients that came in. Um, that day, it, it's very possible that the staff that was here outnumbered the number of patients that was coming in. Um, right around here is when um, New York State and some private insurances were approving telehealth. We weren't there. We were trying to figure out what we were allowed to do, what we could do through the health system, what would be covered. Um, so we didn't roll out telehealth until like the last week of March, the first week of April here at Transitions. Um, then we had 40 people on the schedule and then 34 people came come March, uh, May rather. Uh, Mid-May, we had um, the reopening, it was starting. It wasn't Nassau County, it wasn't Suffolk County that was starting, but New York State was starting its phase one opening for those sites that were like lessening their numbers. So we had 40 people, 44 people on the schedule, 42 people came. As the reopening started, you would see that the numbers picked up. And the numbers picked up and we, we, we had a lot of scheduled visits and we had a lot of people that attended. And you can't, I don't know, can you see the telehealth visits along the screen or am I blocking it out? The bottom you are, part. Very bottom you are, but you can the see. The very bottom. So what happens is, interestingly enough, we had more, um, more momentum of telehealth as we opened more and more people felt comfortable coming on. So come um, September, October, November, December, January of this year, February of this year, we're averaging about seven to nine visits per day of telehealth in conjunction with our inpatient services. Um, so Aggie and I wanted to, let me just go to the next page. Yeah, Aggie and I are gonna tag team. Um, so we just kind of wanted to show you this little picture and then Aggie can go into a little bit more about what we did on site. Um, but you could see we had, we had our normal, normal pre-COVID. We took that big dip between March and May and then we picked up and we picked up um, because people start, uh, started to feel a little bit more comfortable. People knew how to um, manage 
um, with the guidance of the healthcare system and the CDC and the, the Department of Health. Um, people felt more comfortable, people wanted their services. Those that didn't feel comfortable kind of went the route of telehealth. Um, and then we were able to pick up, again, we're not picking, pulling the same numbers that we were because we still have restrictions. We still need to space out and we still can't have as many people on the floor and we can't double up patients and we can't have groups. So we lost a lot of, of those aspects of what we do that we may, I hope that one day we can get to those pre-COVID numbers, but I, I'm, I've been pretty, after I put these numbers together, I was pretty impressed with what we we're able to do, even with all the fluctuations in the spikes after Thanksgiving and after, um, after January break, um, we still had spikes and people were still coming. Um, so Aggie, I'll turn it over to you if you want to talk a little bit about how we manage things on site. Yes. Do you want to keep the slide open or do you want me to open it on, on my end? Do you, um, it's up to you. Uh, you could leave it open if you go seven, number seven. Sure. That's where it starts. You got it. Yes. Okay. So we had a lot of changes that occurred on site and thankfully due to Northwell, we were really able to kind of hear the up and coming changes as soon as they were made. So we were following a mix of CDC and New York state guidelines just to make sure we were on the forefront of both. So um, as you can see on this uh, slide, we kind of talk about a little bit of that exposure risk and some patients were fearful of coming in due to exposure. So they weren't really receiving the same level of care as they might've previously. So maybe when they were discharged from the hospital, instead of going to outpatient, they chose to go home as they didn't feel safe. Um, or for some patients, then we were able to switch to teletherapy. We had to limit the amount of people we were having coming into the building. So previously we had maybe a patient coming in with a home health aide and a family member. We had to limit it to maybe one, uh, one family member or one health caregiver or health provider. So we've been doing that. We've been doing a lot of screening. So patients are screened by our admin or our intake group. And then they're also screened when they come into the building screened again once they come to our floor and we always ask follow-up questions the day of and for following sessions as well. And then I think slide eight, yes, there we go. And this is, has more information about the screening. We've been doing a lot of social distancing in our buildings. So we've utilized a lot of other spaces that were prior treatment areas or waiting areas. And now we've kind of spaced everybody out. So we use all the space that we can on our floor to make sure we can maintain distance between the patients and their family members. Um, like Melissa said, no more group sessions. A lot of treatment has changed across speech, PT and OT. So OT is now more one-to-one -one as well as PT. And from the speech perspective, you know, we don't have the family coming in all the time. It's mainly just us and the patients. And we really need to take the additional time to sanitize before they come in, sanitize after, um, sanitizing the plexiglass, the face shields. So there's a lot of time that goes into that. And I believe that's it. We were changing the PPE requirements as they happened. You know, one day it was double mask. The next day it was back to single mask. Then we were requiring face shields. Those were on back order for a while. So it was really this fluent state that we were in for even till today. Great. Oh, let me stop sharing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for that information. So. Uh... Great to see it all on a chart and just a uh, nice work. Um, how about you, uh, Lisa, as the audiologist? Yeah, so even though it's a different department being a part of Northwell, you guys basically said it all and we're doing the same things here. Um, I think we're wearing the scrubs now. The biggest change back in March of 2020 was really limiting the amount of patients coming in the door at the same time. And it was not just, um, so I'm in the hearing and speech building. So there's speech pathologists downstairs, our uh, ENTs, audiology. So it wasn't just managing our schedule, but when are the ENTs gonna see their patients? When are the speech pathologists gonna see theirs? And because the waiting room, we had to keep you know, very uh, not crowded. So they developed a new lobby downstairs. So it used to be that the patients would all come upstairs where we are, check in. So they kind of put a buffer in between that and put um, front desk people downstairs and then kind of directing them where to go or say, okay, wait until in the car, we'll call you in when it gets closer to your appointment. Um, even during that time, since we weren't seeing as many patients, we would do other things. Like there would be a day that I'm taking temperatures up at the front. Um, 
or handing out masks or helping people check in. So we all kind of, as a team, jumped in doing other things where needed. Um, we, same thing with just even being in our offices together. We couldn't really be, it's a small room, we'll have three or four people in there. So we kind of rotated in the beginning having, I would come in every three days and on an opposite day of somebody else so that we just had more space in the office. It's definitely a challenge. I know this is actually another question, so I won't get into too much of it here, but having only one family member come in is, has been hard for people because you have these families coming in and they're worried about, especially the, AB, the babies who fail their newborn hearing screening and you have the family coming in and you want, both parents wanna come in, they're nervous about their child's hearing and we say only one parent could come back. I can't stand having to do that, it's a terrible feeling. So what I, or what we try to do to make it most comfortable, we'll bring one family member back, we'll do all the testing, and then when we go over the results, we'll bring back the second family member. So it limits the amount of time of having a lot of people in the room, but you still have the support of family there. Um, telehealth for us too, we never really did much of it before now. Now uh, we kind of just jumped right in there for our hearing aid patients at least. Um, for a lot of our early intervention children, um, EI wanted it that they weren't coming into the office unless absolutely needed. So what we would do is maybe do a telehealth conference to explain the hearing aid, go over the hearing aid, and then they would just come in to take ear mold impressions. But we wouldn't go over how to use everything right there in person. We'll say, okay, now tomorrow we're gonna have our telehealth visit and we'll talk about it then. So they're only coming in just for the, the reason if we really needed them to be here and doing everything else through um, telehealth. <clears throat> The cleaning, cleaning and putting that time factor in was very difficult to, um, to manage. So we have, because when we do play with all the kids, they're touching all the toys in the booth. And so we kind of took out all of our toys and put one bin in there because anything that a child touches, we have to wipe down. So we used to have all of our toys out. Now we just do one and we just give it you know, as needed. And our assistant, so if we do a two person test, the audiologist who's doing the testing will kind of leave the room with the patient, go over the results while the assist will stay behind and, and do all the cleaning. So it was definitely a work in progress. I know as all of you probably know, we, kn we didn't know what to do in the beginning and it's just, how are we gonna do this the most um, time effective way? And we had signs on our booths that if we can't get to cleaning it right now, we flipped it over and it'll be like a red, um, like that's not clean. So somebody knows not to use that booth just yet. Um, so we kind of, got down a pattern on who would be responsible doing certain things and cleaning and wiping down. And we got into a better swing of that. So I would say we're back pretty much up to seeing a lot of our schedules fully booked and busy again, but we are also doing a lot of curbside appointments. So instead of having people walk in to have their hearing aid fixed, our interns will run the curbside appointments where they'll pull up in the car and they'll run out and get the hearing aid there um, and bring it back out to them. So a lot of limiting, like you all said, having the patients in the building when we can, um, wearing our scrubs, wearing our masks. Um, we have special clear masks now, which I'll talk about in the next question that we have. Um, but yeah, it's been, it's basically, even though I'm in a hospital, whether it's a private practice, it seems like we've all been going through the same thing, same PPE, all of that. I think also it's a little more nerve wracking um, if we have to go do a hearing test for somebody who's inpatient, um, say they're, they're going through chemotherapy treatment. They're too weak to come over here to do a hearing test. We often will go there to do um, a bedside audio before they have treatment. And now sometimes we get, okay, on the chart, this patient is COVID positive. So we're like, okay, we just have to prep ourselves. Now we're going into a room that we never really thought anything of before, but now they're COVID positive. We have to make sure we gear up and even the, you know, taking off the gloves and the mask, the order and everything to do it. And it was a lot of, a lot of learning and still things like, um, Aggie and uh, Melissa were saying that just um, the, everything changes. Being a part of Northwell, we follow CDC and the, the things are changing. We're wearing double masks and then we're not, and then we're using an N95. And then, so keeping up with all that is, is, uh, is a challenge. But I think if you have a really good team, and luckily I do here, uh, we stay aware, we could kind of help each other out. Okay, great. Thank you so much. So much information and um, just. Um... Really powerful stuff. So our, our third topic is Victoria will be presenting. All right. So what speech language swallowing or audiological problems are you seeing secondary to COVID effects? So we'll start with Melissa, then Aggie, and then Lisa, and we'll finish off with Steven. 
So um, early on, I think we were seeing more of the effects from COVID itself. Um, what, what happened was we started getting individuals with COVID at the outpatient level, I would say in June. I think we would start seeing people that had um, COVID early on in March, April, May, they would make their way to us in June. And what happened was a lot of the times people were not going through the proper course of rehab. So the typical way is you go to the hospital, then you go to subacute care, then you go to outpatient. Um, maybe depending, you might go to have a course of home care in between, then you do outpatient. Um, and a lot of people weren't getting their home care. They weren't getting their subacute care. Um, the hospitals were over, over, they didn't have enough beds to do subacute care. So people were either going home, they were holding them in, the, in their rooms or they would be sent to um, skilled nursing facilities and they weren't getting their therapies there. So oftentimes people will come to us and they may not have had the typical therapy, the course of therapy that they would have had pre-COVID. So they were a little bit more deconditioned than somebody that would come our way. Somebody that would come to us with a neurological condition directly uh, as a result of COVID would have had like encephalopathy, they would have had a stroke, or they would have had co-occurring symptoms, co-occurring conditions that maybe worsened due to the um, infection itself. Um, Aggie can go into it a little bit more because she's going to be speaking um, at the brain injury conference on the strokes. Um, but the, the thing that we noted over time as we're reflecting over this past year and looking at our stats, um, we had a lot of people from June to the fall, but these were individuals that had um, COVID early on. And we think that we're not seeing as many patients now need our outpatient services neurologically because of the, they're going through their proper course course of recovery now, they may be rebounded before they get to the outpatient level, which is great. Um, but also there have been medical advancements in the acute stages of COVID itself in terms of giving them um, like anticoagulants early on to prevent like clots and, and bleeding issues. They, they learned more about the disease itself. So it's presenting all of those sec secondary neurological conditions. Um, so if somebody that was coming to us, um, let's say they had encephalopathy from their COVID, we were seeing the typical things that we would see with encephalopathy. So it would be memory, it would be processing speed issues, it would be uh, word retrieval. Um, the only thing that was a little bit more unique is that um, the, the patients that I saw, they had a little bit more decreased insight into the cognitive deficits. They were very in tune with their physical deficits, but they really weren't seeing that their memory wasn't as sharp or their processing speed wasn't as sharp and they recouped much quicker than somebody with just traditional encephalopathy coming through our doors. Um, Aggie, do you want to speak a little bit about um, COVID and CVA and maybe some co-occurring? Yeah, so um, for the COVID and pre-existing conditions, it was kind of similar in the sense that, you know, we had a lot of these patients coming in with physical and cognitive linguistic deficits that we would see, you know, with patients who had, let's say, cortical atrophy or spinal cord injury, but there was also the side where we were noticing that they really weren't making their typical gains or the typical progress. So we had a patient who came in with cortical atrophy and we had tried to maybe facilitate and teach some compensatory strategies, but we noticed that there really wasn't much progress at that time of discharge. Um, so we had some patients who responded really well to therapy and made significant gains and were discharged and you know, we were very happy with the work that we did. It just, we noticed across the board that, you know, the, the presentations were often exacerbated by their prior level of functioning. So that was where our COVID and pre-existing patients, then we did some work with some COVID and CVA. So when we were looking into some of the cases that we dealt with, we noticed that there was a lot of variation in their progress as well. So we looked into four different cases and across the board, we noticed that the physical and cognitive linguistic deficits were similar to what we would see. However, their progress across the board, whether it was OT, PT or speech varied. So in some patients, they made great physical gains, however, had more deficits in the cognitive linguistic area, whereas it's the opposite. We had really great gains in OT and speech for cognitive linguistic skills, but physically they weren't able to kind of get back to that pre-morbid level. Um, another thing we noticed too is that 
um, patients' insight to their deficits varied. So I was working with the patient who came to us following COVID who really didn't realize that she had such severe word finding deficits until maybe month three or four into her therapies where she became more aware of those deficits. And then we also had a patient who initially made really great physical gains and then cognitive gains kind of came a little bit later down the line in months like four and five of her therapy. So there was just a lot of variation across the board in the progress that all these patients made. That's, that's okay. what I have Thank to say. you. Um, Lisa, how about you? So I'm gonna be super quick for this part because I, we, I asked my colleagues, we talked about it today. We really haven't seen too much in terms of audiology. And I would imagine that for speech language pathology, you would see a lot. So it's interesting to hear what you guys are seeing. Um, but we haven't really seen anything come out of regarding to hearing loss um, associated with COVID, except I would say in the beginning when this first hit, we were having a couple of patients come in complaining of hearing loss that were COVID positive. And they had a lot of unilateral hearing losses. And that was just an observation we happened to see. There was, we didn't you know, study it or anything, but um, I don't know if there's any relation with that. And probably just things like, like tinnitus increase, but nothing really that's striking that we've been seeing in terms of, of hearing with COVID. Okay, thanks. How about you, Steve? So the, the effects of COVID that I see in, in my practice are more on the voice and swallowing aspects, um, not so much on the cognitive component, um, but I just wanna mention one thing about cognitive. Um, in dealing with uh, the patients that I deal with, the OPWDD and those that already have cognitive deficits and are really, um, unaware of how sick they really were, um, they seem to have bounced back really well. Because, and I'm speaking to the, um, the chief medical officer of the, of the facility who's also on the state and they've all discussed this. And it's just a, a fascinating finding that it's across the board that, that those patients, um, because of the fact that they're not aware how sick they were, um, don't get as depressed as someone who has more of their cognitive faculties and understands what's going on. So that, that's um, an interesting observation on COVID effects. Um, but as far as voice um, goes, um, because it's a virus, we've seen some uh, paretic and paralyzed cords um, because it's attacked some of the nerves. Um, I've been talking to some of the um, laryngologists and um, you know, we all scratch our heads to find out really what is COVID doing to, to voice. Um, I do a lot of respiratory retraining. It's a, it's a respiratory illness. We have patients who have been intubated for prolonged periods of time. Um, so they have difficulties, you know, again, producing voice and getting back and they, they come up with these um, uh, characteristics that they, they try and compensatory strategies that they try and it's all wrong. So they end up uh, creating more pathologies for themselves. My runners who, who um, my athletes um, who I see for vocal cord dysfunction, um, some who have had them and they're young, they, they find that they have more physical aspects, their joints hurt. Um, I have some who have had um, cardiac COVID where all of a sudden they become tachycardic and we don't understand why. These are healthy young um, individuals as well who are, who are athletic. So we're seeing those types of things and we're not exactly sure why. Um, obviously COVID, but we don't know the effects of COVID per se. I'm also seeing a lot of um, our professionals who are having voice disorders secondary to the changes that are being made in delivering services, having to wear masks, being extra dry, not being able to be hydrated enough, um, constantly talking over Zoom, because if you, don't, if you don't talk all the time, we have that lull and we don't like void. So they find themselves talking more than they should. There's also no more rest because um, there's no more interpersonal um, you know, um, interactions that take over for that actual voicing. So we're seeing more pathologies as far as that. Wearing masks, um, you know, we're seeing those effects on, on, on COVID with the younger um, kids because they can't engage. Also the babies all they recognize are eyes and foreheads. I had one little baby um, with, with her mom saying, it's me, it's mommy. Didn't even recognize mommy because of the mask. That, so it's, it's really affecting every age group. Um, 
across the board. So the effects are not just physical, they're also emotional. Um, so we're seeing a lot of emotional components. And I know from um, our health center, when you look at stats, the stats of psych have rocketed um, because of what's going on with the effects of COVID. So it's just a dynamic um, you know, uh, effect um, overall on, on everyone. Thank you so much. Great points sure. again that you guys have all been presenting. Um, so our fourth topic, uh, Victoria is going to present again. So what problems are the long haulers presenting with regards to hearing, speech, swallowing, language, cognition? So for this, we could start with Lisa, then Steve, then we'll go to Aggie, and then Melissa. So there might be some redundancy with the last one, but if there's anything new you want to add about this. So yeah, kind of like the last one, I guess even with, with decreased uh, cognition, things like that, it's going to make anything more difficult managing a hearing aid, even doing a hearing test. They have to be alert and aware and be able to be reliable and when they're responding to the sound or being able to you know, manage their hearing aids. And if they have hopefully family members or aids with them, um, that's great. That's a huge help. But um, other than those type of things, I, I didn't notice too much of a change other than um, the typical it's hard to tell whether it's just hearing loss that they've had or if it's from COVID, it's really hard to uh, separate it. So I don't really have much to add for that one. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Melissa? Um, I don't think I have a tremendous amount to add to this because I feel like um, our patients are variable just like the disease COVID itself. Um, some people made these rapid recoveries um, and then some of them followed the traditional patterns that you would expect to see following a neurological insult. Um, and then some people are, are in it and it's hard to say, are they in it for a longer haul because of COVID or are they in it just because the level of their neurological condition would have been like that regardless. Um, but I do want to say that I am a victim of abusing my voice for some reason over teletherapy. I shout and I realized last fall I had so much strain and neck tightness and hoarseness. So I am a victim as well. So that's it. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I almost prefer teaching in the classroom because I have the mic. If I'm on <laughs> Zoom, I feel like I'm shouting and there's nobody in my house but I don't know why I shout it's like I'm trying to reach you I know, <laughs> I know. Well, like Steve said we're missing that interpersonal you know sitting knee to knee with patients so it makes a big difference um Aggie um yeah Aggie do you have anything else to contribute to that one um yeah just mainly that I've noticed uh, maybe prior when we have patients come on for maybe three or four maybe longer five months I've definitely noticed that once it comes closer to discharge even though they're doing great and they've met all their goals they really don't want to leave us here because then they really don't have anything to continue on with. So for a period of time, there were no university clinics. Or university clinics weren't really accepting new patients. So when we discharged, they were kind of sent to home with any activities we could provide them with or any home care that they could get. So it's definitely improved recently when universities are providing teletherapy or there's more options now that we're discharging. But um, back in like June, July, I definitely had a couple of patients who when I discharged, you know, didn't really know what to do next. So that was something. Excellent point. That's a big struggle because you want to prep somebody for the next steps and what they need to do. And it's like socialize, stay cognitively active. And yeah. nobody can do that because everybody's isolating and still at home and have so many restrictions. That's a great point. Yeah, I've actually also noticed um, a couple of my patients actually mentioned that they started doing group chats. Um, there's like, I guess they've been getting together with their friends or family via Zoom. And that's been keeping them cognitively active. So it's another opportunity where Zoom's made amazing gains in the all over the world. So that's something I've noticed. Yeah, those are some good points. I wouldn't even think of that. Like the fact they were sending, you're sending them home or, you know, discharging them from the facility and what do they, you know, who do they have to interact with and to do? Uh, Steve, how about you? Anything on your end? No, it's, it's pretty much going to be redundant. Um, you know, it's, it's very hard to know. Um, what's going to happen, you know, later on as you treat the patients. But, um, you know, that's a great point that because we're limited to the um, patient only typically um, without having a caregiver with them because of uh, the distances uh, of, of COVID restrictions, it's hard to explain the carryover. 
So when they take home that HEP each week and we explain what we're supposed to do or what they're supposed to do, um, there's not that other individual to assist them. Um, so, so getting the instructions um, carried forward is, is very difficult, I find, um, you know, when treating the patients. Uh, you know, time's going to tell, um, and that's, that's really where we have to stand with this. As more and more people, you know, um, are vaccinated and more and more people hopefully are coming back into um, the norm um, and we could do traditional therapies again, I think that's when we're going to start to see um, things return, hopefully. Um, but as far as the patients that have been affected going forward, it's going to be hard to tell, at least in my, my um, hands on with them. Hi. Great. Thank you so much. Yeah, I think it's just we still don't have enough information right at this time in regards to the long haulers. So our fifth topic, Caitlin is going to present. So how has the pause on the ability for family to visit or attend sessions with patients in the medical settings impacted your work? Um, if Aggie, if you can start off and then we'll go to Melissa, Steve, and, and then Lisa. Yeah, so here at Transitions, I'd say we started limiting family members or caregivers as soon as we found out, you know, with the social distancing mandate. So um, we started by realizing who needed to have one-on-one -on -one support. So the patients that had one-on-one -on -one support would either then bring a family member or a home health aide. Otherwise, family members would bring them to the front of our building, they would be dropped off and they'd come up to our floor on their own. Um, in terms of how we've been dealing with it from speech, I'd say it was always really crucial to provide examples and material for the family to be able to continue the care that we provide here at home. So since that wasn't really possible face to face, I found myself doing a lot of, you know, scan to PDFs and emailing material. Um, I would be providing phone calls and follow up calls just to make sure that they received my emails and were able to open my emails. I had a lot of patients who learned what a PDF was for the first time. Um, and then I found phone calls became very usual. My phone was ringing quite a lot. So that was one way that I kept in touch with family members. And when possible, if family members did feel comfortable coming in, we would then move to a larger room. So we have a lot of different spaces here, transitions, and we have one room that we would then use for um, maybe evaluations when the family members come or treatment sessions when we would have a family member come in. So that way we could space everyone out with six feet and still be able to not be pressed against the walls. So that was something I've noticed. It's definitely been harder being able to carry over that material to home, especially with some of our patients who do have cognitive deficits and don't really remember to show their family members that binder or to follow up and do the activities independently. And Melissa, anything to add to that? No, so on site, that's exactly, I mean, that's some summarizes um, our interactions with caregivers. In terms of telehealth, um, what I did note, it was a little bit of a positive. Everybody's in lockdown and everybody's working from home and um, it actually sometimes offered us access to family members or caregivers that we wouldn't have had typically. They're home, they're not doing anything. They would pop in, say hello, and I could provide education or instructions. Um, and typically they would have been the person that was at the office that wasn't able to kind of connect with so easily. So I mean, that was just like a one little bright side of like maybe a little bit of an easier access because everybody's home there, the, the spouse is there or um, the caregiver's there or the daughter's there to help them set up the, the equipment or whatever the case may be. Um, so yeah, I mean, it definitely created more of a distance or more creativity needed to connect with the family members. Um, but in respect to telehealth, sometimes it allowed us a little bit easier access um, to those people. Hey, who's next, Lisa or? Steve. <laughs> oh, Steve, sorry. Steve, so, go ahead. <laughs> so I, again, um, I'm going to agree with um, Aggie and Melissa on, on all those points, um, you know, that, that, you know, distance was definitely an issue, um, having one patient and maybe one provider, if possible, um, assisted. The telehealth um, allowed us to, again, um, interact with family members that um, we typically wouldn't have um, because they come in, especially in patients that live in, um, you know, group homes where there's different staff members. So we're able to touch on staff members and almost do in-services 
on how to maybe um, present a meal for argument's sake or how to mix up um, a, a thickened liquid. So we can actually group people that way. So I found that very um, effective. Um, one of the, you know, on the negative side of this is that um, technology is, and, and Zoom, and, and we, we became so advanced so quickly. And, you know, as the average person, I didn't know how to use Zoom right away. And I found that a lot of the older populations, they weren't too keen on using a computer. They didn't know how to download Zoom. They didn't know how to operate the Zoom. So we also had those aspects of difficulties during COVID with interactions. Um, because the, they didn't want to come out and yet they couldn't get the therapy in-house either. So it's, it's been really, a, you know, a wild ride on, on the swing of those that were really technologically savvy to those that really didn't know how to use it to the fact that we were able to touch people that we really weren't able to because of teletherapy. So it's, it, it goes from one extreme to the other. Great, Lisa, uh, do you have anything else to add about the families? Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, I'm in agreement with everybody, what you guys all just said. Um, what I'm thankful for, so if we're seeing like a cochlear implant patient and they have this whole backpack of equipment and we always say, make sure you bring a family member with you because it's a second pair of eyes and ears. It's just helpful to when you get home to work through it together. Um, so luckily we'll have one family member come if possible, but a lot of times they, they're not able to. So we have some like Cochlear Americas, for example, set up a separate team that um, people can log online and make appointments and they can help them right from their home. So instead of going through everything in the office, which also keeps them in the office longer, we can say, here's a reference for you call when you're at home with a family member and they can help you through that. So we've been very lucky that their hearing aid companies and, manu and uh, cochlear implant manufacturers have been developing these separate teams um, for connectivity issues for them to call and that also then they're not calling us all the time for it too. So they have all these extra extra support at home, which is great. Um, I find myself writing down a lot of things. So I know the transition of getting this information and then bringing it home and working on it. Um, I write it down for a lot of people now. And sometimes like the main important things that I find writing over and over, I'll make copies of and say, here's a helpful sheet to take with you. And just so it's something tangible that they're not gonna forget. Um, but that's pretty much, yeah, it's, it's tough, especially when they're learning something new to not have uh, that full support team be able to come with them. Okay, great. Thank you. And I know the next topic you guys have mentioned, you know, in various um, ways during our, you know, other topics, but uh, Ashley's going to present our topic six. So what are the effects of face masks and social distancing on communication at work? Um, we can start with Steve and we'll go with Lisa, Melissa, and end with Aggie. So um, the face masks, as we've talked about, um, varied, single mask, double mask, um, KN95s, N95s, um, depending on what we're doing, plus face shields. When you're working with patients that have um, and, and again, Lisa, you might be better off on, on talking to this point, but when I find um, they have hearing deficits and depending on the thickness, so I have a regular thin mask, okay, the paper mask, the KN95 mask, the beak bill N95. So my voice already has been dampened. Um, so I find that depending on what we're wearing also has an effect on how we're communicating with our patients, which also then makes us use our voice with more energy. Um, so it takes a toll also on the provider as well as it, it forces the patients to become better listeners because they need that communication. Um, so the communication breakdown doesn't occur working with articulation and being able to see an articulator. Um, you know, if I said, well, you wouldn't be able to know which fricative that was because you can't see. So that's where those masks came in. I don't have them, but um, you know, we also use the face shields um, to also assist with at least a, a, a barrier um, so that they can at least see and then put back the mask. Um, 
so those, those are really my um, basis for the breakdowns of, of communication with um, COVID, but it's necessary, you know? And again, it was fluid with what it was that we were demanded to use based on the CDC guidelines. Um, what was an aerosol procedure versus what was just a regular procedure. And you had to, um, you know, adhere to that. And aside from that, you wear glasses, everything fogs up. So you can't even see what you're doing at times. Um, then you're wearing a face shield on top of that. So glasses and the face shield fogs up. Um, and then the sweat pours down your face because you're wearing plastic all over. Um, and, you know, it's, it's just a domino effect from a provider's point of view of what you really have to go through um, to treat a patient. So it's, it's just very interesting um, on those on those effects. Okay, thank you. Uh, Lisa? Yeah, I 100% agree with that. Um, uh, somebody with hearing loss already has difficulty being able to hear and communicate. And then you take away the, the visual aspect and it's 10 times harder. And so it's, it's hard on the patient um, being able to, they feel like they're doing more poorly than usual. So it's a lot of counseling involved also to say that now you're, you're missing out on the person's lips, you're losing a lot of information. Um, and so don't be so hard on yourself that you're not doing as well as you, you should be doing. Um, it's a lot of counseling with that. Luckily we have, um, we've been using a lot of um, it's like an FM system, but connectivity devices, like a mini microphone that they can have with their devices um, that I can wear and even be like on the other side of, of the room and talk into it and it'll go right into their implant or their hearing aid. So it's a little bit closer, more direct, <laughs> but the face mask is very, very tough. And as an audiologist, I find that I speak on the louder side um, usually, but now with the mask, I'm even more. So I'm out of breath pretty often at the end of the day. But um, we do have these clear masks that, and the only problem with this is that it's not a, an N95. So I don't know, it's not really as protective, um, but for somebody that it makes a huge difference if, if it's a matter of if I put this on and they're gonna be able to follow my communication enough that we don't have to write everything down, we end up using it. So it's a little, it's a little startling if you're not prepared for it because it just shows like a lot of teeth and, and mouth, but it's helpful, mm -hmm. very helpful for the patients, um, I find. And I even tell the family members too at home, if you, or if you're wearing masks around your loved ones that have hearing loss, they can get clear masks if they feel comfortable with it. And it does make, make a big difference. Uh, but like Steve said, with the glasses, and then I have these goggles that go over my glasses and then I have the face, the face shield and the duck bill N95. Um, so it gets, it gets hot and you have to go through a, a lot of material, but I find the patients, they really, they all complain about, I have my glasses, my mask, my hearing aids are on behind my ears. So we try and give them some pointers, maybe have like a, the tie that goes around for our different type of mask. So that takes that off of the ears at least. But we've seen a lot of lost hearing aids for that reason because they're taking off their mask. There goes the hearing aid. Um, so we're seeing it's tough. It's definitely tough on the patients um, and the providers. Yeah, I have to say I, I lost a hearing aid. Um, <laughs> I had I did. I it was under warranty, but I had a really Good. busy day. Mask on, mask off, mask on. A lot of different places. Aid off. It was yeah. gone. I have a lot. really I have a really hard time understanding speech without my hearing aids. Um, without hearing aids, with masks, I'm really at a deficit for speech recognition from a patient's point of view. Um, so I, I confirm everything you're saying. Yeah, it's definitely difficult. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, thank you, Wendy. Melissa? Um, I have not too much to add. Um, it was really nice to finally get our clear masks. Um, we were, it was back ordered, so I don't think we got it until the fall. Um, it really helped certain clients with dysarthria and apraxia be able to see our, our visual model. Um, definitely not as comfortable. It takes a little bit to get used to for seeing, but it was also helpful when the patient would wear one of the clear masks that I could see what was going on if they were groping, if they were overshooting, undershooting. It really helped with a lot of that uh, biofeedback for us. Um, I did have a patient that ended up um, staying 
live in person for OT and PT, but requested that we switch to teletherapy because she didn't want to go get fitted for her hearing aid at, during the pandemic. She just didn't want to expose herself to any other facilities. And she was relying on people lip reading prior and she felt more comfortable doing it via teletherapy. So we flipped to that. So it's definitely, it's definitely a barrier. It's definitely something that um, is hard to kind of hurdle over. Um, and we're just kind of kind of pushing through. Maggie, anything else to add? Um, yeah, just that I feel like I've had to get really creative. So with some of my hard of hearing patients, I've prepped a lot in advance. I had everything written out so that I was giving them the verbal as well as the written. Um, I started using a lot more of the, we have uh, different iPads that would have the Lingraphica app. So they sometimes they model the exercises. So I've been using that when I couldn't directly be the model or maybe, you know, even if we have the clear mask, it fogs up the minute I kind of open my mouth and start doing exercises. So using the iPad and seeing my model kind of helped them do the activity themselves as well as a mirror. So sometimes my desk would have the iPad, the mirror, and I can kind of show you the plexiglass situation. So it'd be a lot of things at once on your desk, kind of switching between them. And, you know, then me having to go around the side and adjust the mirror, make sure they could see themselves. So it's just a lot of balancing and trying to figure out what works best for each patient. I actually did have a patient who lost their hearing aid in the parking lot and we went to go look for it together. So mm -hmm. that was I had a... somebody lose their <laughs> hearing aid in my office too. Yeah. You know? <laughs> just because of the mask. Well, I'm happy we found it though, because it was not insured. So it was a great day for him. <laughs> oh, great, great. So, so many anecdotes too. So our last question topic um, before we open up obviously to the audience, um, Ashley's gonna go over our last topic. Yes, so how are you coping personally and professionally while handling your workload? And what advice do you have for future audiologists and speech language pathologists? Um, we can start with Melissa and we'll go with Aggie, Lisa, and then we'll end with Steve. Um, so I think early on, I mean, through the pandemic, it just kind of shifts what your personal needs are. Um, early on, I have a seven-year-old son, so he was home from school. Um, so trying to balance trying to work full time, trying to stay home, trying to do teletherapy, trying to homeschool him. Um, that was a very uh, interesting time in the household um, for my mental health, um, for my husband's mental health. I think all of our <laughs> mental health was really um, tested. Um, and you just kind of have to roll with it and just wherever you are in the moment, just balance what you can. You, you can only do what you can do, I think is what I've learned. I've learned that I could do way more than I possibly thought I could balance. Um, and I have learned to accept that I need to be flexible, um, that not everything is gonna be perfect and ideal and I'm not gonna have everything that I want, whether it's in terms of the perfect treatment space in the terms of the perfect perfect work from home space, um, have a perfect classroom um, at home. Um, so that was a balance early on. Um, now we just balance the um, edginess of him possibly being exposed at school and having to go into quarantine. So that's something that's always like as a parent and a professional on my mind that I might be losing time because I might have to take off just because of that. Um, the exposure is still, the risk is still there. You know, I'm getting more comfortable and confident. The schools are doing what they need to do. Um, he, I, I feel like I'm going to jinx myself if I say this. He's <laughs> in school full time, five days a week. He goes to the morning and after school program. And um, we have not needed to quarantine and he, his class has not needed to shut down. Um, all this time, I'm still like holding my breath because the spikes are coming up a little bit, um, coming off of this little vacation holiday that we've had. Um, but that's something that I have to budget. I can't just take a day off just because I want to take a day off anymore. I have to bank it because I might need to be using it um, when I have no other choice. Um, but I think just as I think we all are, we have, we've just been flexible and we'll get through it. And I think that we're just helping each other. Um, um, when we flipped to teletherapy, I don't know if anybody realized it, we really weren't experienced in it in New York because it wasn't an accepted thing. 
I went on these websites and webinars for people that have been doing it in different states and everybody was just sharing their knowledge. And I would, I would go and jump into like pediatric um, speech language pathology and, and hear how they would just navigate like translating their therapy. And I was like, oh my gosh, they've been doing this and I could do this. And I think just, you know, helping coworkers that are struggling with childcare themselves <laughs> and just being there for each other is probably um, the best advice I can give for anybody, whether you're just starting your career or are ready for retirement. I think just, I think us being there for each other has been the biggest um, advice. That's it. <laughs> Um, so I was coming in, I would say throughout most of the pandemic, my schedule, I would say hasn't really fluctuated much aside from the fact that um, for a period of time, it was very quiet here at Transitions. We would see maybe a couple patients a day for speech. Um, I definitely started to get a little stressed out once things got very busy. I started wearing my civilian clothes to work, changing into scrubs at work. So I would leave anything that I wore at work at work and then take my own clothing out into the car. Um, I found myself sanitizing everything, including all the surfaces in my apartment building because I live in a, there's eight different um, units in my apartment. So I was technically felt myself responsible for all eight. So I was cleaning <laughs> the main railway, the doorknob, name it. I was sanitizing because I knew I was the only one that was really coming and going. Um, and I wasn't sure if they were being responsible. Um, and also was coming home to my fiance who was sitting at home and not really leaving. So I didn't want to be the one to introduce anything new to our apartment. Um, but then in terms of being at work here, it was really great to have the support of coworkers that were both here and also working from home, kind of checking in all the time, seeing if you know, we needed a hand with anything or, you know, if I was having a slightly busier day, maybe someone who was having a lighter day would help me, you know, space out my caseload. I would say just being flexible. Um, being able to be flexible, not being too hard on yourself. And, you know, maybe this session didn't go according to plan, but the next one can go better. You kind of learn with each session that you had. A lot of my patients were very stressed out when they were coming in. And I noticed a lot of my sessions were spent counseling, kind of talking them away from COVID and into more positive thoughts, like maybe future vacations or seeing their grandkids again. So always kind of trying to keep things positive, even though I noticed it was hard for me myself to stay positive. So it was nice. It was a good balance between my patients coming in and trying to like be positive as well as me being positive and us helping each other. So I would say just being there for your classmates, teachers, parents, anyone who's kind of dealing with this in their own way. That would be it for me. Great, thanks, great advice. Lisa, how about you? Any? Uh... Peggy, I, the, the words I was going to use were flexibility, teamwork, 100%. Um, I have to say I've been pretty fortunate this entire time to not have COVID, you know, so close to me or experience uh, it close uh, at hand. So last week, a week and a half ago, my significant or other had COVID. And so we, we were quarantined for 10 days, but it was the first time that I couldn't prepare to be out of the office for 10 days. It was like, oh, wow, okay, you're positive. Now I can't go to work for 10 days. I don't know what's on my desk. I don't know what messages are still on my voicemail. And it's, it's hard It's knowing that now that's going to sit for 10 days. But luckily, my team, um, they were able to scan in some of my test materials into um, electronic medical records, records so I can access it at home. I could write a report. So they all did that for me. They also sent so much food, which made me cry, which was mm -hmm. just so nice because you have like a family at work. It's not just, you know, your colleagues, they, they're all there for you and you're all in this together. So if you can designate or delegate different tasks, like um, if you're having a very busy day, like Aggie said, and then somebody has a lighter day, take over because there's a lot more um, things that you have to account for for this. If you're on the phone more often or you're talking to a family member who wasn't there for the appointment, they have follow-up questions. There's a lot of extra um, time that goes into an appointment or patient care. And so if you can kind of space it out between your teammates and relying on each other and just being flexible because we still don't know so much about this and things change quickly. And um, so being flexible and relying on each other is so important. Yeah, Steve, you have any final thoughts? On that? <laughs> I mean, it's really been a touch. I mean, I came from a little bit of a different um, world um, because I was in private practice. 
So, and my wife is also um, a partner in the practice. So there's two of us here. So when we closed down, I, I mean, coping, I needed a lot of coping because I thought my practice was going to be lost. Um, you know, I didn't have um, that, that um, mega health system um, to back me up and keep me afloat. And all of this had to go on the backs of us. And plus I'm responsible for my therapist. So there was a lot of coping that, that really had to go on. So I have two kind of worlds here. I had that aspect of it. Um, and then what do we do with our patients? And then how do we even get in touch with our patients? Um, you know, I've also had a lot of loss um, of patients due to COVID. So I had to cope with, with that as well. So um, being nimble, um, I know flexible, I, I usually use the word nimble, being nimble um, has really um, helped us. Um, you know, I would also talk to other private uh, practitioners and, and kind of, you know, we would share what we were doing as far as how to reopen. Um, I also sit on the board of, of Lisha and um, we were getting phone calls um, across the island of what do I, what PPEs are necessary? Um, what air purifiers do we use? I mean, there was no guidelines to that, um, to even say, use this one, um, you know, get that one, um, you know, so, so we were kind of like in the midst of um, turmoil um, and just trying to muddle through it and help each other out and, and do the best that we can that way. So on the private practice end, that was a little um, unsettling. Um, again, once teletherapy um, was approved by um, Albany, and again, um, I, I was really on a big push for that, um, for the necessity of speech for us to continue to do teletherapy um, um, with Albany. And finally, they passed that. So that was a little comforting um, and, and assisted with some coping because then I knew my practice could continue. But you, you go back to those slides of, of um, the decrease, there was a major hit. Um, both at the health center facility base because people weren't coming, um, as well as within the, the practice. So um, being nimble and saying, oh, you don't want to come in today, but let's do teletherapy was a wonderful option um, to be able to switch, um, you know, like that. Uh, so that was, that was helpful. Um, again, um, you know, listening to my, my daughter who is um, dorming um, at a university, um, which we all know very well, um, you know, and, and what they're going through and then they were coming home and then they were going back and what they can do, what they can do. Um, I told my son, he has given new definition to learning through osmosis because all they do is they stay in their room and they learn in bed. I never saw anything like this. So <laughs> that kind of coping also, I was like, what's going on here? How are we, how are we learning? Um, and he, he also now going through, um, looking at universities and colleges and everything is via Zoom because we can virtual because you can't actually go there um, to look at a place where he's going to spend the next four years. So COVID has really taken effects on, on family, um, you know, on us on, on, a, on a personal level in that fashion. But again, being nimble, being supportive, um, being positive, um, being as smart as you possibly can, as safe as you possibly can, um, and sharing that knowledge with others, I think, has really been um, a key factor um, in, in my world anyway. Um, as far as um, for future, um, it's, it's really, you know, again, being able to, to be flexible and, and as was mentioned, not being upset if the therapy didn't go exactly the way you had planned. You need to be flexible, you need to be nimble, you need to be understanding. Um, as a clinician, also explain that to your patients that, you know, there are different times now. Um, you know, we're going to do the best that we possibly can. Um, and, you know, also Zoom has helped for families to connect. Um, so that's the positivity. We, I, you know, we talk about Zoom giving, you know, for Thanksgiving, uh, you know, do, do holidays via Zoom, do birthdays via Zoom. Um, so I think that connectivity and that encouragement of, of positivity really helps um, the psyche for a lot of people. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, so we just wanted to open up the floor to anybody who's here. <laughs> um, if uh, you have any questions, I don't think anything's in the chat, right? I'm not seeing anything. Um, Wendy, you're not seeing anything in the chat, right? No. No. Um, so does anybody have any questions for our speakers? 
I just want to like um, say thank you so much to our frontline warriors, um, Stephen, Melissa, Aggie, and Lisa. You know, day after day, just showing up and doing the best for your clients and for the profession. And um, it's not easy. Um, I know some sometimes uh, I had my own experience getting the clinic up and running. Um, the, the march was a blur to me last year. I don't even remember it. Um, but, you know, your tenacity and your professionalism is uh, much appreciated uh, by the profession and, um, and by our students for sharing this information. Um, this, this was invaluable, um, what you shared uh, with our students today. I hope they remember and I hope when they go out for their externships, they remember to take some of, some of the pearls that you left them. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you.